We open with an image of Lucy living a domestic life of tranquility and hardship in prehistory. Lucy is like us, but different. Shorter in height, longer arms, mostly vegetarian but opportunistically omnivorous. Lucy is an Australopithecus afarensis, a precursor to the modern human. Or, precursor isn't quite right somehow. An ancestor, maybe. Because we can be sure that Lucy did not think of herself as an anticipator of a species. Not as a forerunner of any kind. No. She probably saw herself much as we see ourselves. As the brilliant conclusion to an inferior lineage of evolutionary antecedent. Lucy the culminator. Lucy the finale. Lucy the concluder. Lucy is very beautiful, but her face is unlike ours. More ape-like in its flatness and with its jaw protrusion. Her hands, though, display a startling modernity in their shape, robustness, and proportion. And scaled up, we can mirror the creases in her palm to our own. And so we trace the line from the Paleolithic through the ages of metallurgy and into the present day. And now, looking back, it is detail like this that leads us to the consideration of Lucy as a transitional being, neither human nor a beast, but a unifier, a linkage. Lucy, the connector. Millions of years later, let's say three or four million years later, I'm thinking of the Hydra. I'm leaning on my elbow in a doorway or a hallway, and I think I can sit forever this way, with my unoccupied arm outstretched, reaching toward nothing in particular. It's as if my strength has been decoupled from weariness. It's as if my cells have cheated death. It's as if some great restorative force might flow forth from the wellspring of my good intentions and my open mind. I read about the Hydra once in a National Geographic magazine I found in a stack in front of a nice house on the east side. The yellow spines were uncracked and glittering in the morning light. Apparently this simple little lake monster is biologically immortal. That's right, a tiny sea creature that cannot die. Well yes, it can be eaten, or afflicted by disease or parasite, but old age, no. The hydra cells will regenerate endlessly, untroubled by the passage of time. I imagine myself on a great ship built of ancient bristlecone pine, surrounded by these impossible animals. The birthing of the ship is full of lumber, and as I cross the oceans year after year, I replace piece after piece of my vessel. The masts, the rigging, each plank of the hull, until slowly, imperceptibly, the ship is reborn. And is it transformed or transubstantiated? What is it like to be a Hydra? Perhaps in order to wonder what it is like to be a Hydra, one first must suppose that to be a Hydra is to be like something. We may just not know how to describe it. In other words, the failure of language to accommodate a detailed description of an existence should not lead to a dismissal of that existence's vibrancy. Does the Hydra have any sense of itself, with its grotesque tentacles? 
Does it know shame, embarrassment, jealousy, hunger? It must know hunger. I read that Hydra have no mouths. Instead, their entire bodies rip apart, reconfiguring to create a massive orifice that they use for eating and for shitting. I suppose that something must compel the Hydra to open itself up, and I imagine that that something must be something like hunger. But in the shadow of the eternal potential of the Hydra, our 300,000 years of humanity appear brief. And I read about Lucy and her species too between those golden covers, and they somehow survived over 900 millennia walking in the tall grass, prodding with their spears of wood and reed, perhaps occasionally retreating to the safety of the trees, from which their brave ancestors had gradually descended. In the descent, they straightened their spines and flattened their feet, little by little, generation by generation, becoming Lucy, and then slowly, with near imperceptibility, becoming human. How fleeting even those 900 millennia of Lucy and her kind now seem to me, having so long since passed. How momentary. We might call it the condensation of distant memory, or the foreshortening of forgetting, or the indifference of not knowing. What was Lucy's moment like? Did she have a stable dwelling, maybe in a cave or beneath a canopy? Did she return there each evening to lie down on a bed of grass and leaves? Or did she have some other space that she thought of as home, more befitting of her transitional status? And when the end came for Lucy, that final transition, how did it come? Some people think she died, and that typical irony of fate, falling from a tree, let's say, a bristlecone pine, from which her evolutionary antecedents had long before descended so gracefully. Fractures in the upper arm bones and in the rib cage suggest to the speculators that she had a long fall, landing on her feet, and then tumbled forward onto her arms and chest, suffering wounds that would eventually kill her. What an eternity those hours of suffering must have been to Lucy beneath that great bristlecone pine. And how human-like her suffering must have been. You might say that there is a kind of immortality in suffering. For when one suffers profoundly, the suffering tends to present itself as without end. For eons after the fall, Lucy's body lay in the dirt, and as it decayed it was consumed by sediment, which penetrated the bones with mineralized groundwater. This produced gradual and inconspicuous effects, dependent not on any single act of violation, but by the ceaselessness of the mineral force, and at each giving way the bones were further penetrated, until millions of years later, they sat fossilized within a sandy bluff in Ethiopia. Perhaps there too had been a hydra there beside Lucy those eons ago, glowing in its translucence in the rippled light of a brook, floating from shallow to shallow through the centuries, following the glaciers as they parted the land. Perhaps it is that very hydra that we look upon now, 
placed delicately upon a slide stage with the precision of a fine set of evolutionarily ordained fingers and thumbs. An obituary. Hydra. Dead at 3,219,876 years. Because it made a nice picture. Somewhere in our timeline, perhaps fueled by the biomatter of Lucy's decay, a bristlecone pine sprouted from a seed. Over the next 5,000 years, it too enacted the principle of ceaselessness, advancing in height and breadth, minutely, unspectacularly, but now offering us a glimpse into prehistory as the oldest living thing on Earth. The bristlecone pine the oldest living thing. In my opinion, 5,000 years is a reasonable upper limit to mortality. But I wonder, what is it like to be a bristlecone pine? Its attribute is gentleness. Its instrument is time. This is what makes it powerful. As parts of the tree get old and decay, other parts sustain the operations of life, transmitting fluids, consuming energy, expelling waste. In a very real sense, the plant is at once living and dead. New growth comes on old growth. When our scientists wish to measure the ages of these enduring and unassuming plants, they damage them irreparably. Another obituary. Prometheus, the great basin bristlecone pine, dead at 4,862 years, sacrificed to research in 1964. You are marvelous, I say to my palm reader. I'm having my palm read. I've been reading magazines and thinking of bugs and ships and trees, but I'm between apartments, and what I need is a home. I present my hand, and first my medium sees nothing. Cognitive mist, she says, drawing away from me. Then she speaks. Leaning in, tracing my lifeline. You will come upon a great house, and for want of shelter, you will approach. I might live in the gardens, you will say, but there you will find a downtrodden people and a frightening insecurity. Crossing the threshold, you will think, I might live here in the entryway, but there, as suitcases unfold, paths of egress will seem to recede, and temporariness will yawn into permanence. So you will advance. In the kitchen you will find toil, and in the dining room consumptive 